Guys, this video is a very important video. It's, it's something that impacts every single one of you. And whether you realize it or not, what you're seeing happen today in today's society is no different than what happened to Native Americans when the government tried to take over, deculturalize them, take away their food sovereignty, and force them to eat government rations. Um, think about how that was done, how it was implemented for the purposeful tactic of taking over their sovereign nations, for taking over the people and controlling them. If you really put two and two together, there is no difference between that and what you're seeing today. And ironically, we're seeing the largest movement in, in, in the Native American communities that we've ever seen in moving back towards Native foodways because they recognize what has happened. They've seen what it's happened to their own people and they want to take those rights back for themselves. And they're out there fighting for it every day. What's sad is that most Americans aren't doing the same thing, which means that the largest group of people in our nation are about to fall into this enslavement and they've already started to fall. They're already well into the enslavement that the Native Americans have figured out and are fighting their way out of. Um, and, and honestly, you know, I've had several people on our channel who work with Native youth in helping them understand uh, Native food ways and, and bringing them back into uh, that process. And we're hoping that at some point in time, our Rural Youth Development Fund can help assist with some of those projects as well, because um, that's important, bringing people back to their, their, their cultural truths about where they come from, the food that they eat, their DNA foods, genetically, you know, all of this stuff is important. But the main concept of this video is to help people realize just how crazy this system has gotten. So let's get into it. Hey there, friends. It's been another week since I've been on here. I just can't seem to catch a break. Last week, or a couple weeks ago, my holdup was I decided to teach myself a lesson about stabbing myself in the hand with a chisel. Uh, last week, I taught myself a little bit of a lesson on toxicity and having chemicals in the back of your truck that are unscented. Needless to say, the lesson didn't turn out well. I ended up in bed for several days, didn't have a clue what was wrong with me, and then um, I was reading about that uh, mass casualty event of 54 people in Pennsylvania. I don't know what it is with the state of Pennsylvania and them not being able to control chemicals. I mean, between the trail, uh, rain, <coughs> train derailment uh, last year and then this recent chemical crisis that I, last I heard they still hadn't identified the chemical. I identified my chemical, but after watching that, hearing about the symptoms, put two and two together, found a tipped over brand new bottle of unscented mineral spirits in the, the back seat of my, my work truck. That'll nearly kill you if you inhale it for too long. So anyway, as much of a hazard as I am to myself, I am back on here today. Uh, those of you who placed orders last week, they will go out today or tomorrow. I apologize for the delay with just my wife and I. When one of us is at a commission, everything seems to get really chaotic, especially with, with a farm to run kids to homeschool and trying to run a business and a nonprofit all at once, you can imagine how one person out of commission changes everything. Today, I wanted to talk about something though that also has to do with Pennsylvania. And this is a case that is starting this week. And believe me, people, what happens in this case affects and impacts every single one of you because this case is setting the basis for a law that could stop you, a farmer or a homesteader, from feeding the food that you grow and raise on your own property to your own family. Believe it or not, as, as much as you think that this is a right that you have, there are people in this country who want to take that right away from you. Um, and they want to do it in the name of safety. Then there's a difference between, I think, the government coming out and saying uh, this is a public safety issue and, and then privately trying to manage your own safety. And we've seen this over the last couple years. You have a right to your own choices, to, to how you choose to um, 
conduct your life, what you choose to put into your body, you have a right technically to choose what you buy, right? Um, but then we put in these consumer protection laws to protect the consumer. Well, that all sounds fine and dandy until they start telling the consumer what they don't have the right to buy, what they don't have the right to use their resources for. When that protection goes beyond just protecting public negligence to preventing people from exercising their constitutional rights, then something has, has broken in the system. I, I read some, some people's comments on this particular subject and they were concerned that um, the way that people were talking about this was, was leading towards anarchy. Um, and so I wanted to just start off with this by explaining this. I believe that our government serves a purpose. I believe that our government is governed by a constitutional republic and that the highest law of the land is that constitution. And that is not anarchy. That is a law. That is the law of our country. It is the highest and supreme law of our country. To go against that law is strictly tyranny in the United States. The Constitution is the highest law of the land. That is what made this country and that's what makes this country great. That's what gives people the freedom and the liberty and, and the reason why you have millions of people trying to flood our southern border. Well, besides our welfare programs and NGOs. Anybody who oversteps those constitutional powers, anybody who tries to take them away, anybody who tries to modify them without the consent of the public, um, and, and, you know, our Constitution has had many amendments throughout the years. They've been voted on. But anybody who, who disregards that is not abiding by the law. They are the criminals, not those who are saying, you know, this is, this is a, a, a breach of our rights. Um, so, no, it has nothing to do with anarchy. That's ridiculous. People who think that are, are, have no respect for what this country actually stands for. And I'm gonna just put that out there blatantly. I'm gonna to talk today about the case of Amos Miller because um, what has happened in this case since he was raided this last time is that the um, Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture, it would seem from what I have read, what I have heard, and if it's true, then you really need to pay attention to this case, has pretty much stopped them from um, selling milk, and if they had their way, they would not be able to provide milk to their own families that is produced on their farms. Um, and and they, they've actually gone after a lot of the products that Amos is producing. Um, I think the raw milk is the one that they've gotten an injunction on. And they've even tried to overstep beyond the bounds of the state of Pennsylvania uh, deeper into Amos Miller's association into other states and put a ban on what can be sold in those states and produced in those states, which they have absolutely no right to do, which tells you right off the bat that this agency has lost complete control of their senses. They're not acting within the Constitution of the United States. They are no longer a legal entity in my perspective, but um, this is a, a court case that as many things should be, should be worked out in court where judges can weigh the opinions of the law against each other and, and make a decision. Um, unfortunately, it costs a lot of people a lot of money when these disputes come out. Hopefully, um, we see this, this, these rulings move in Amos Miller's favor. A couple things you need to realize about this particular case is it's not just about, you know, I highly doubt any court is going to say that any farm should not have the right to feed their own family with what they produce on their farm. That would be such an grievous overreach of, of government rulings. I, I mean, th that, wouldn't, that wouldn't fly past the Supreme Court, but you have to watch these state rulings and how they end up impacting decisions higher up. It always starts in these lower courts. It has to, and then it moves up to the upper courts. And once those upper courts make a decision, um, that's the final decision, right? So um, these cases are always important. And even if they don't end up going anywhere in the long run, 
the fact that people are trying this should have you on high alert. Remember, we just had the University of Michigan come out not too long ago with a study stating that backyard gardening produced more carbon than conventional gardening. Conventional tilling with chemicals, etc. Your homestead is, is causing a bigger environmental disaster according to that study. And I'm sure there's lots of ins and outs to it. I know some of you had comments to that. But these cases end up having a much larger impact. So let's talk a little bit about Amos Miller. He, he, he can't sell any raw milk products at, at all. He, I mean, he's completely frozen. I mean, the uh, so it's he, not only that, he has to dump out all the milk products he has. And the order's so broad, it could be misconstrued to mean, oh, with that you can't even feed yourself. That if you're an owner of a farm, you can't even feed yourself. You can't even feed your family. You can't even give it away. That's how nuts the power they're asserting here. That's why the Amos Miller case is the future of food freedom in America. It, this case will likely decide that. That's how critical and essential this case is. The interesting part of this case is that Amos Miller operates under an association. And so this isn't just a case against Amos. Amos is um, just the one operating this association with, with probably one of the larger farms. But he actually sells products from Amish producers across the United States. You know, Amos is a, and, and Pennsylvania knew this, he was a distributor. And it was, he, 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 there's a bunch of Amish farmers that work with him, and they know this. So it's a hit on the whole Amish community, right? All of a sudden, everybody is out of money for a month uh, or, or more. And, and they're trying to put them all out of business forever. And that's what their ultimate objective is. They're overt and open about it. Permanent injunction, prohibit him from ever doing, from selling anything, from giving anything. There are many farms that are a part of the Amos Miller Association. All of these farms are being impacted by what happens in this case. But I think it goes further than that because it's not just you know the fact that these are this is an Amos Association, but this is a private association. You know how many farms there are that sell farm shares, uh, cow shares. We, we have a, a cow share for, for raw milk, and I'm going to get into that in a little bit to help you understand a little bit more about that. But um, th these, these private organizations, private farming organizations, allow informed consumers to make a private choice on where to buy their food. Um, I don't think that there's anything wrong with a government agency regulating the foods that go on the, the, the shelves of grocery stores and saying, hey, you know what? The people who walk in here don't know what the heck they're, they're buying, so we're gonna regulate this and we're gonna regulate how much poison of everything can go into everything because believe me, there's a lot of poison in the food on grocery store shelves. The things that you buy in the grocery store shelves do have harmful ingredients. The thing is, is that they're regulated. The amounts are regulated. Uh, what can go into them are regulated. Look at the applesauce situation where there was too much lead added to the cinnamon to improve the flavor and it, it caused lead poisoning to children. If you read the articles, if you read what happened there, it, the amount of lead was so many times above the allowed amount of lead. These are things that consumers are unaware of, but they don't have to be aware of it because the government is regulating it. Um, and if you want to choose that way, if you want to eat that way, if you want to be oblivious to where your food comes from, by all means, have a government agency regulate what goes on your store shelves. But when it comes to private to private business sales, I think you shouldn't have to have a private association to sell your food to private citizens that wanna buy your food. I think if somebody came to a farm and said, I want to buy your meat, I want to buy your raw milk, I want to buy your eggs, they should have every right to do so without having regulatory oversight. And the thing is, is if that farm does not perform to their highest standards, if that farm has bacterial outbreaks or anything like that, that farm is going to go out of business and it is in their best 
interest to do everything to their highest standards possible. I mean, and that is the reality of a free market is when somebody, when something happens, the business goes under, right? Um, now, if it's by mistake, you know, there are ways that, that farms can mitigate that. Um, but, you know, when you look at several of the recalls over the last several weeks, the, um, the, uh, the, the, the beef and ham recall, or the, the salami and ham recall that happened, the, uh, there was another raw milk from a raw milk producer in California. These were cases that were widespread, had massive recalls. Um, Amos had two possible cases of E. coli, you know, and, and these larger corporations had recalls. They didn't get prosecuted, have fines, etc. They had to recall it. I guess that's a loss of income, but um, they're still allowed to operate, still allowed to sell because they've bought into the, the process and, 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 and regulations that they have to abide by. Amos is choosing to sell through a private organization where the only relationship is between him and his consumers. And in a perfect constitutional United States, there's nothing wrong with that. He's created an association to make sure that everybody reads their membership agreement when they sign up and that they are agreeing to the fact that they are informed consumers. They're, they're, they understand that they're dealing with a private enterprise it, it, instead of a public domain agreement. And they're basically members of the association, just like the farmers are. So they're, they're buying in shares to this organization to be able to buy the, 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 the products that the association meets and, and, and eat them. Um, under the current injunctions on them, farmers producing the products can't even buy you know, the products back to feed their families. So th there, this, is, this, is a, this is a bigger hit because it's, it's impacting uh, the association, which is a private entity, private membership organization, um, which has been going on across the United States for quite some time. Um, people will sell, you know, shares of a, of a, of a live cow that they can't get processed anywhere but a custom butcher. And then um, when that cow is, is harvested, then those who own the shares get their portion of meat. They might have to pay a little you know, more based on you know, what their agreed upon investment was on the hanger. But um, you know, these, these types of relationships are, would kill small farmers if they went away. You know, the, the fact that this is a, such a large organization is why it's getting prosecuted, because if they can make an example of Amos Miller, they shut down all of those other farms. They, they suddenly have a legal case, uh, a doctrine that they can go in and shut down all of those other farming relationships that are out there, those private transactions between uh, informed citizens and, and informed producers. And, and that to me is extraordinary overreach of the government. But like I said, you know, to have regulations on things that go on the shelves of grocery stores is fine. You know, there is actually a prime act that has been proposed that would allow farmers, and this would help us out because right now we're in this situation. We can't take our cows to any of the inspected facilities nearby um, because they don't allow horned animals. And we have a heritage breed of cattle that has horns. And so in order for us to process our cows, we have to do it through the means of a custom butcher. We cannot resell that meat. Um, you know, to process a cow for our family is a lot of meat. Uh, and we've discussed ourselves you know, maybe we should sell some shares of our cows to some people locally. And, and then that way, when we process one, um, you know, we're, we're providing for others. We would be doing it on a cost basis um, just to be able to manage the herd that we have. And unfortunately, 
it's going to force us out of the heritage breed cows and into one of the commercial breed cows because if we want to maintain our property and we want to have cows that we can process and sell for meat, we're going to have to go with a commercial breed that the facilities will allow in their facilities. The, these laws have greater impacts than, than I think were ever intended. The Prime Act would help to um, alleviate some of that. They would allow us to take the cow into a custom butcher, butcher it, sell the meat um, across state lines, et cetera. So that would be a, a great thing. But again, you're, you're, you're dealing with an inspection process. And at the end of the day, if I had cows on my land and I had a trusted customer base, people who were informed consumers, wanted to come to me, wanted to buy the meat that I find perfectly safe for my own family to eat. Um, I don't see what is wrong with that transaction. The only thing that's preventing me from doing it is because of what they're doing to people like Amos Miller, which is exactly why they're doing it. And, and like I said, this goes beyond anything we've seen before because this is penetrating a safety net that, that farmers have been using now for for decades, a, a way to bring in basically investors in their farms who want to have farm grown food, invest in it, pay for it, and, um, and not have to, to go through you know, the grocery stores. I mean, there are some people who really, really rely on this food that is this clean. There are people out there who cannot just simply go to the grocery store and trust what they buy. They can't buy something that's, you know, been been treated with, with certain things to make it preserve and last longer on the grocery store shelves. It could be detrimental to their health. There are people out there who rely on this. So Newsweek uh, wrote an article that spurred me to talk about this again today that I found rather interesting because one of the, before I thought about talking about Amos Miller. I was actually going to talk about some of the headlines that I've seen coming off. I mentioned several food recalls in my last video. I said that you're gonna start seeing more headlines creating fear tactics around animal uh, agriculture products, food particularly, foodborne illnesses. You know, that you need to be scared of these things. And these are scare tactics that we've seen going way back. And when I get into raw milk a little bit more, you're gonna understand the history of this and how impactful it actually has been on people. Um, but the point is number one, to steer people away from um, animal-based products. You know, they're, they're bad for the environment, right? So we need to get, change people's diets, get them away from it, till up more land, you know, use more chemicals to grow our foods. Because the reality is, is that most of the places where cattle are raised aren't suitable for crops. For example, if you look at our land, it's very hilly, very rocky. For me to till up that land would cause so much erosion, I wouldn't have much left after a year. It would just all erode away. It would go downstream. There's nothing holding it in place. So what I have is I have grass. And what I do with my grass is I convert sunlight into energy in the grass and I have cows on it and other things. I have sheep. I do have horses. Some of you think horses are a, a waste of, of space, but I can tell you this, if an EMP ever hits and everything becomes useless, I'm still gonna be able to get around. Um, but the point is, is that I have grass and that is the main thing that I can grow on 90% of my farm. I can't grow anything else. There's not a crop that'll go out there. And that's the way this farmland has been for years. So having ruminants out there that are breaking down those grasses into good soil that will help replenish the roots of the grasses and help extend those roots further into the earth on slopes, rocky slopes that normally wouldn't be able to just retain the dirt without it. Um, those, those ruminants then are creating a protein and a high density food source that um, I can use to feed my family, I can use to help pay for my land, pay for keeping this environment a pristine environment. But with, with those news articles coming out, Newsweek caught my surprise when they published an article on Amos Miller. And this is actually what they said. Conservatives have been building support for Miller ahead of his February 29th hearing in a lawsuit brought by the Pennsylvania Attorney General's Fund. Conservatives have been building support for Miller. Here's the thing that I don't understand about this is the constant 
turning of sides in all of these arguments. Clearly, Newsweek is clueless on this um, topic because I have spent the last several years with my wife traveling across the country, across the continent, between Canada and the United States, filming farms and ranches. You know, for the last couple years, it's been mainly bison ranches, but before that, we filmed all sorts of different farms for our farm series, which we're hoping to get back up. And I can tell you this, we never met any group of people that were made up of a solitary political party or political belief. But one thing that all of these farmers can agree on is Amos Miller, because all of these farmers can agree that the current food system, the current regulatory system of what's going on with our food supply is a complete overreach of government power. Every single one of them in their own words, in their own way, in their own interviews, in fact, I can put a video together quoting all of these people that will say, number one, the small farmer is in trouble, farmers in America are, tr are in trouble, and a lot of it has to do with large corporations controlling government regulation and shutting out small farmers, which is exactly what you're seeing here. You're seeing a shutout of small farmers. Newsweek goes on to say that Susan Schwartz, an assistant professor of political science at Swarthmore, told Newsweek that while Republicans have run on an anti-government platform since the Reagan area, the recent outrage over Miller's case, an example of government overreach, comes amid a renewed push for limited government that has been spurred by the FBI raid on Donald Trump's Florida home in August of 2022. The reality is, is that this the, the, the issue of our food supply, controlling our food, it goes well beyond any of this. The energy has been behind it well before 2022. If you've listened to anybody on YouTube who's a farmer, who's a rancher, Meet My Neighbor Productions, our nonprofit, has been around since uh, 2019, I believe, several years before 2022, to discuss these exact same problems, to help open people's eyes to what's actually going on in our food system, and help consumers make better choices, help more people become informed consumers that will go directly to farms and ranches to purchase their foods. This isn't a brand new movement, Newsweek. In a press release announcing the lawsuit, Pennsylvania Attorney General Michelle Henry said that Miller's refusal to comply with the law has been ongoing for years, which is true. She emphasized that other foodborne illness outbreaks had been tied to Miller's farm, including a death from listeria, and pointed to the legal action he's faced for noncompliance. Now, that statement is halfway true, halfway false. Um, he has been, you know, in, not in compliance in their eyes for years. But again, this is a private association. And to my knowledge, they haven't brought a single association member to come out against Miller, having a complaint against Miller, saying they, they've been sick or anything due to Miller. The Amos Miller has served his products tens of thousands of Americans. Well, for, for years, for, for, for decades. Yeah, for decades. The, you're talking about millions and millions of products eaten and consumed. And, the, and you know how many customer complaints any state or federal agency has? At the risk of having this taken out of context, zero, Robert. Z imagine that. Um, this is this case is a legal case of the state against um, Miller himself. The the case where somebody passed away from listeria, this was a lady who had cancer who had moved to a a home in Florida. She was living with relatives for a very short period of time. It was late stage cancer. She was literally dying when she moved there. And they had some of Miller's raw milk, or they were members of, of Miller's um, association, but I don't believe that they even had raw milk in the house while this person was there. And, and as they said, the person was very ill and dying anyway. They, they placed no blame on, on Miller or his association. And that's one case. And mind you, there's, there were two possible cases, and he ships to 4,000 customers nationwide, okay? So there were two possible cases of E. coli to 4,000 customers nationwide that could have possibly been linked back to his farm. This is a very different thing than the recent raw milk recall where there was a lot of E. coli and they were able to trace it right back to the, the um, 
the facility it came from and do a, a recall because it's an inspected facility and that's all that they, they were charged with. The, the fact that there were only two cases out of 4,000 customers makes you question the entire thing. We cannot, she says, we cannot ignore the illness and further potential harm posed by distribution of these unregulated products. We have long had food safety laws in this commonwealth to protect the public from harm. Pennsylvanians should know what is in the products they and their families are consuming. According to the Lancaster Online Editorial Board, Miller's disdain for government regulation makes him a threat not just to consumers, but also to other farmers. An outbreak of foodborne illness caused by raw milk, for instance, could harm the businesses of other Lancaster County dairy farmers who are operating on thin profit margins and couldn't withstand a hit to the county's reputation as a producer of safe and healthy foods. There is a very good reason why the nation's food supply is subject to government regulation, so that people don't die. They want you to think that you could die if it's not regulated, and they want other farmers to side against Miller in thinking that Miller's reputation could harm theirs because they're in the same county, right? Doesn't mean they have the same practices. This is all about government regulation. How many times did you hear me say unregulated or this is why we have government regulations? To protect you, right? To protect you as the consumer. We have to protect you and we're doing the best by you. Ignore the extra lead in the applesauce. So I wanted to t talk to you guys a little bit about raw milk because that seems to be at the heart of this case. And um, I think that raw milk helps put some perspective on how government regulations and the, the push of, of government regulations and, and making food cheaper and more available to consumers is actually, while that is not a bad concept, has had a very negative impact on our food supply, okay? So we have to put a lot of these things into perspective because there are rules and regulations that are great and they, they protect consumers. And like I said, if you're going to the grocery store, you know, let that stuff be inspected. But there's a difference between that and having the independent right to make the decision to say, hey, I want to go buy from, you know, my neighbor, Farmer Joe, and, and I trust him. I, I like his practices. I like the way he treats his animals. I know where the food is coming from. And I know that there's no preservatives in it. I can get it straight from him. It may not last as long. It may not have the shelf life. You know how much shelf life milk in the grocery store actually has versus raw milk? And I'm gonna explain to you why. But the fact that that stuff lasts forever isn't good for you. Have you ever put a loaf of bread on your countertop and seen how long it lasts? It's still fresh after a couple weeks. Try making some sourdough and see how long that lasts on your countertop. Real raw food, food that's good for you, has stuff in it, stuff that's good for your, for your gut, stuff that is living, bacteria, things like that. Um, we were actually discussing this. We had some boys and we were, we were teaching them how to cook. And um, one of the things that we were teaching them are foodborne illnesses when, and how, what temperature you, you should cook your meat to and et cetera. And I kind of laughed on the sidelines to, the, to one of the other um, counselors that was there. And I said, you know, I, I personally like to eat my steaks pretty raw. And he, he made the remark, well, that's, you know, he's like, I do too, but you have to realize like our guts have built up to it. We've, our, we've been trained, our bodies have been trained by very sterile food for so long that it is actually hard for us to consume those other foods. And they actually are better for you. When you, when you eat, if you can handle it, if your body has adjusted to it, when you eat some of that stuff, it's, it helps regulate your system naturally. You are a part of nature, right? And so your ability to adapt to nature is, is, is been essentially hindered by, um, by our over-processing and over-sterilization of food and then over putting in preservatives. So we're not just talking about you know, the preservatives, the add-ins, we're talking about the over-sterilization, the over-processing of the, the whole nine yards, okay? There was once a time when most of the milk consumed was raw milk, and it came from cows that were out grazing in pastures like ours. And a lot, there wasn't a whole lot of problem with that milk, right? It, it was pretty normal to have a milkman come by and bring you raw milk in glass jugs that came from 
pasture-raised animals. This raw milk contains proteins and nutrients that are actually very good for your body, very good for your gut. There's always gonna be some risks though, right? When you, when you eat raw, we, I mean, there's risks to eating the chemicals that are in the preservatives of food today. We, we read about those risks all the time. There's long-term death risks from a lot of that stuff, long-term cancer problems, gut disease problems, etc. But those risks are okay by the regulating agencies. The short-term risks, or the, the, the back then you had some moderate risks from raw milk of some bacterial infections, you know, getting some some Lucy stools every now and then. There were, there were risks, but they were relatively moderate because it was a very natural environment of raising the cow, milking the cow, and bringing that raw milk to the table. There wasn't a, a whole lot in between there. So what they started doing with milk was they started pasteurizing it. And what that meant was that they, the old fashioned way of pasteurizing it is they'd bring it up to 150 degrees Fahrenheit. That temperature is enough to destroy most of the enzymes in the milk. Most of the enzymes that were destroyed in pasteurization would actually protect against pathogens. They would attach to vitamins and make them more easily absorbable to your body. I mean, your body was designed to absorb this, this stuff naturally. So what we started to do just to make sure that the milk was safe was we would heat it up to this 150 degrees and we'd take out a lot of those benefits from pasteurized milk. High temperature pasteurization started coming in, uh, you know, after the old fashioned way of heating up to 150 degrees. It's, it's also known as fla flash pasteurization, where they'd heat it up to 161 degrees. Now at 161 degrees, you actually kill all of the en enzymes that are in the milk and you denature most of the, some of the proteins in the milk. So now the milk has become uh, a, a very low nutritional value at 161 degrees. For those of you who like to drink hot milk, think about it that way. If you heat it up over 150, and this is raw milk, I mean, you're, the milk you buy in the grocery store is not even high, high temperature pasteurized. I'm gonna get to what you're drinking in the grocery store in a second. But traditionally you had pasteurized at 150 degrees and you had high temperature or flash pasteurized at 161. And, and by the time you hit 161 degrees, you kill most of the enzymes, destroy most of the proteins. You're not getting half of the benefits or not even three quarters of the benefits of, of what that milk was meant to produce to your body in the first place. Now, ultra patch pasteurization is what you drink from the grocery store. What they do in ultra pasteurization is they actually have the milk move across stainless steel plates at 284 degrees. <laughs> 280, imagine what you killed at 161 degrees. Now we're gonna heat that milk up to 284 degrees. And what that does, it, it was designed to kill, you know, the endospores of um, hibernating pathogens that could come back to life in the right conditions for the milk, right? But in the process, you kill all the proteins, all the enzymes, and all the nutrients in the milk. The milk at that point is so dead, right? It, I mean, there's, there's nothing in it. It's killed everything in the milk. It actually has an, a, a shelf life of an extended period of time without refrigeration. The reason why they refrigerate it in US uh, stores is because when they started ultra pasteurization in Europe um, and they brought the concept to America, Americans were kind of weirded out by the fact that they were drinking milk that wasn't refrigera refrigerated on a shelf. So they refrigerated it. It lasts maybe a little longer refrigerated, but for grocery stores, this was a great product because they could stock it, they could put it on the shelves and it would last for a very, very long time, whereas raw milk wouldn't really last that long. As it turns out, there was a study conducted in 2019 on rats. They, they study everything on rats. They do, uh, they're doing an HPI testing of, um, you know, the adv advanced function of the virus on rats right now, actually in the state of Georgia, which is kind of a really bad idea if you ask me. Georgia's gonna be the next epicenter of something. They also wanna put in a monkey facility with 30,000 monkeys, test monkeys, in the state of Georgia. State of Georgia is gonna become one of those massive lab situations and it, and it always happens. They also get hit by hurricanes. So this is just not a good idea. Not a good idea at all. But for whatever reason, the, the science gizmos want to do this and they want to put it in Georgia and you're testing the, you know, advanced function of a, a 
virus, bird flu, HPI, which if it breaks out into a mammal like monkeys and rats and they're able to make that happen, would have a 50% fatality rate on humans. HPI has a 50% fatality rate on humans. I don't know if you guys heard anything about that, but that that's scary. Anyway, there was this uh, 2019 study that found that processing milk causes the formation of protein oxidation products, which impair spatial learning and memory loss in rats. So as it turns out, that overprocessed milk really isn't that good for you, is it? So how did we come this far? You know, were, were there problems with milk? Yes, there actually were problems with milk. And it, maybe it's understanding where those problems come from that can help us understand what has to be regulated and what doesn't, what might be a little bit of an overreach of the government. Is raw milk in and of itself that dangerous? This is a conversation my wife and I have had a lot because we like the health benefits of good raw milk, but we also want to be careful where it's coming from. We also recognize that it's unregulated. So in the summer of 1983, an outbreak of listeriosis occurred in Massachusetts. 49 people became sick and 14 of those, 19% died. Listeria is the bad actor among pathogens. Most pathogens make people sick, but don't kill them. Listeria, in other, on the other hand, often kills, especially the very young, the elderly, and the immune compromised. Listeria most commonly occurs in deli meats, seafood, raw vegetables, soft cheeses, and poultry. But the 1983 outbreak was different. It came from pasteurized milk. Imagine that, pasteurized milk is what caused this, this outbreak. Now, there is a, there's always been a moderate chance of getting it in any of those foods, including raw milk. But now it was happening in pasteurized milk. So you have to understand what happened throughout the history of, of milk production to understand how it ended up getting into pasteurized milk. Pasteurized milk, which was being hit at 150 to 161 degrees if it was high pasteurized milk. About a year after that, a huge outbreak of Salmonella tifamirium occurred in Illinois, a second wave in 1985. The pathogen was found resistant to most common forms of antibiotics. Two surveys determined the number of persons who were actually affected yielded estimates of 168,791 and 197,581 persons, making this the largest outbreak of salmonellosis ever identified in the United States. At least five people died out of the 170 to 100 or 200,000. The outbreak affected people in six states, Illinois, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Michigan, Iowa, and Indiana. Health officials concluded that the milk was contaminated after pasteurization, which persisted in the plant despite the efforts to eradicate it. So this is where they went to ultra pasteurized because what they, they found was that it, it, it managed to exist in, in sleeper cells until they were able to um, regenerate in, in the perfect conditions of the milk storage. So clearly the 1980s were had a lot going on, which is why we, we moved from pasteurized, high pasteurized to ultra pasteurized milk. But there's, there's a bigger history to all of this that I think you need to understand as a consumer, a, a consumer who's choosing where their products come from. Bit mass consolidation in the agricultural industry really kind of started picking up in the 1930s with pigs and in the 1950s with chickens. And you see this today, you have these factory farms with these animals in very tight quarters. Um, diseases and things are, are, have, a, have a stronger environment to thrive inside those bins. They have to keep those environments very sterile. Um, there's a lot of effort that goes into that um, to keep things down, one of them being antibiotics. There's a famous quote by Earl Butts in the 1970s, who was the agricultural secretary, who basically said, get big or get out. And maybe what he meant was get indoors or get out. By the mid-1980s, so we're, we're backtracking back up to all these outbreaks and in, in, in pasteurized milk, this concept of getting big and getting inside started really taking on in the dairy industry. The U.S. Department of Agriculture was actually advising dairy farmers to keep their cows inside and grain fed. So now how do you maintain the health of animals 
that are living in confinement. It would be like, you know, if I put my cows out on a pasture and I had too many cows out there, what they'd start doing is they'd start overeating the ground and then they would most likely start getting worms. Whereas if I have wide open pastures with lots of things for them to, to eat on, they don't have to eat over the top of each other constantly, the, the chances of them getting worms or the chances of them correcting worms um, are, well, the chances of them getting worms are much smaller. The chances of them being able to correct it on their own with the nutrition that they're able to get out on the field is much higher. So um, when you put animals into con um, confinement or in a tighter space, even in an open field, when, when you have too many animals in a field, you get more diseases, you get more things like worms, you get more pathogens. Um, if you put them into confinement indoors, now you have even a greater risk. So how do you mitigate against that risk? How do you stop these animals from contracting pathogens and other things that could cause problems with our milk products, problems with our meat products? There's a simple answer to all this, antibiotics and vaccines. And, and what's interesting is you started seeing this trend in the mid 1980s, right? And suddenly you have pathogens that are able to withstand antibiotics because nature is, is a constant evolution, right? And so what happens is these pathogens become stronger against the antibiotics. So you suddenly start having antibiotic resistant pathogens. And then the only way to get rid of those pathogens is through ultra pasteurization of heating up the milk to 284 degrees and making sure that there is absolutely nothing in the milk of nutritional quality for even the consumer. We haven't just seen this in the dairy industry, we've seen it in the cattle industry, we've cattle industry in general, we've seen it in the swine industry, we've seen it in the poultry industry. We now have these highly pathogenic bird flus that are going around that are extremely unusual. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that we keep trying to manipulate science. We keep trying to stop science from moving forward and, and confining these animals and putting them in situations that are simply unhealthy. So then it comes back to, you know, how much do we have to put into these animals? How many vaccines, how many uh, antibiotics to keep them alive, to be able to put food on the shelf the way we're doing it with this big get big, get big or get out scheme that's been going on since the 70s. And it started actually back in the 30s and 50s. Now we're talking about mRNA vaccines. I mean, and, and what we have seen with the antibiotics and vaccines that we've put into these animals is that it actually has an impact on the pathogens around them, which then means that it's having an impact on the entire ecosystem. It's something that just continues to grow out of this practice. And so then the question then becomes, you know, as you as a consumer, is that what you wanna be eating? Do you wanna be eating this food that's been packed with all of these things? Or would you rather be eating food that has been naturally grown, food that hasn't had contact with these things. It's coming from an environment that's been free of them. Because chances are, the cleaner the environment, the cleaner the food, the safer it actually is for you. At the end of the day, you know, these, these steps that have been taken through science, the, these, these steps that people have taken to try and improve our food supply system, they weren't done with bad motivations, okay? They were done to try and supply people with more affordable food. And they've, they've reached the point where they have affordable food on, on shelves. Well, they used to be affordable, now it's not affordable anymore. But they've, they were able to make food available to many, many consumers on a mass scale. But that came with a lot of costs and a lot of consequences. And the other costs and consequences of those is that we've consolidated the industry. We now have just a few major meat suppliers, a few major food suppliers who basically stock the shelves of the grocery store. If you look at the chain of, of all the different brands in there and who owns those brands, it could be narrowed down to just a few companies. And that comes with a significant amount of power because everybody has to eat. And so everybody is eating and feeding into those few companies and those few shareholders who then have control over the entire market. You have basically lost all sense of food sovereignty, all sense of food security. But with all of those consequences, as an informed consumer, somebody who can go out and make your own decisions for yourself, who can make somebody who does have the right, believe it or not, 
you do have the constitutional right to make your own decisions on what you eat, what you put into your body, and what you barter to get it for. And if, if you want to barter dollars and cents for it, you should have the right to do so. Just because it's a currency regulated by the United States government doesn't mean that you shouldn't be able to go and trade that currency for something that you want. And if what you want is clean food, food that may come with some risks, but not nowhere near, in my opinion, the risks and the, the manipulation that the food comes from in your grocery store, you should have that right to buy it. All of these things that they make you afraid of with food that you're buying in the grocery store today, the meat on the shelves, the, the cheeses, the milks, all of this fear that they put out there of foodborne illnesses, a lot of it was brought upon by ourselves, by our own development of the industry, by trying to improve a process and seeing our own self-destruction in it. And now that self-destruction is threatened, and so what they're doing is they're stepping out and they're threatening anybody who's offering anything that's an alternative to it because they recognize that people are waking up to what's going on and they recognize that the only way to stay in power and to keep the, the flow of, of money coming to their pockets instead of spreading to other sources is to shut them down, to bankrupt them, put them out of business. That's what's happening with Amos Miller. Anyway, guys, until next time, food for thought. Think about this. Follow the story of Amos Miller because what happens in that courtroom is going to start to set a precedence. It's going to create a case, a court case that will then be referenced against every single one of you.